Hi, and welcome to the Boat Princess podcast. My name is Nikki Vo, and I'm your host. I am a boat owner, a marina owner, a director on the Marina Industries Association, and a huge advocate for boating. In this series, I'm sharing the stories from every nook of the boating industry with the intention of encouraging more women to join me and for more women to get behind the helm too. I want to share the experience and opportunities of boating, of the boating industry, and I want you to join me as I bring the conversations and answer all the questions you've had. Boating is not just for the glamorous and rich and famous. It's full of beautiful and interesting people making the most of our natural environment and getting out there, enjoying the waterways. So let's set off the lines, take over the helm and escape to the world of boating. Good morning and welcome to... Oh could be good afternoon. You could be listening to this in the afternoon. So we're going to say good morning and good afternoon. This is the Boat Princess podcast. I am coming to you from Sydney and I have a great guy with me um, who is in a, another very different space of the boating industry. And as you know, that's my whole aim to um illustrate to you all all the different things you can do in this amazing industry that we're in. So this morning I'm talking to Andrea Francolini and I'm going to get him to speak Italian at some point because it makes us all feel so good, huh? <laughs> if you say so, buongiorno. <laughs> Come stai? I'm very good yourself. Good, thank you. <laughs> so Andrea, tell me what you do. I'm a photographer and I've been sh photographing boats for the past 25 years, of which 22 are in Australia. Wow. Yep. Okay. That's what I said when I realized it the other day. <laughs> so when you say photographing boats, give me some different ways in which you photograph boats. Photographing boats means photographing events, photographing new boats that are built. So you have to do the interiors, the sailing part or motoring part, depending what kind of boat it is. And uh, images can be used for events, advertisement, press releases, a wide variety. The other day, actually, somebody printed a huge picture on a curtain for their camper van. Wow. I know. And it looked really cool. And I saw the picture and I was saying, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I thought they were going to put it on the wall inside the camper van, but no, it's on a curtain when the roof comes out so they can get sheltered from the sun. And I did have to make fun of the owner saying, so this is when your wife takes you to Ayers Rock to go camping and you're so far from the water, at least you can see your boat. And he just didn't answer that. The, <laughs> the phone went quiet for a minute. So I think I touched the soft spot there. <laughs> oh, 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 I love that. So that's a, that's a really, yeah, it's just you don't think about how many ways photographs can be used these days, that the whole digital process of being able to transfer that further to somebody. Um, the images that you've created means the opportunities are endless now, aren't they? Yeah, they are, especially with social media. I would say 90% of the pictures that we take go on social media because that's a new way of communicating. But then every now and then there is a surprise. There's something from left field that comes out and it's, uh, it's nice to see. Yeah, you've had some amazing things happen with your photographs lately, haven't you? There have been some nice outlets, yes. Yeah, so, tell me about a few of those. So we've had, uh, I'd say mainly our photo competitions, which are nice. Um, they're good for awareness, but it's also good to have somebody else in the industry judge your picture who's uh, objective to it because obviously i see a picture and if i like it of course i like it because i took it but it's uh it's difficult to see if the picture is really nice or it's not so, so to have somebody who doesn't know you who maybe doesn't even care about what industry you're in but just judges the picture for itself it's a nice recentering of your uh of your ideas because you know yes i have many ideas not all of them are good oh well there was a there was a instagram post i read um recently and it said um Things always happen for a reason. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes it's because you're stupid and you've made a bad decision. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and you, you have to be stupid, otherwise you're never going to learn. So <laughs> I embrace my stupidity. <laughs> but the, the the you've had some mo because I've seen your Instagram. I mean, your Instagram posts are amazing, always, Thank obviously. You. But every now and then I'll see a post for you on LinkedIn or so on that tells me where you've actually been published and you've had some incredible ones lately. Can you share some of those with us? 
Um, I've had some stuff, I mean, overseas, the pictures are always going there, that's, which is nice. Um, I'd say this, not strangest one, but the most different one was something on uh, Kuwait Airlines in their in-flight magazine, which was not sailing related. It was uh, related to a, a trip that I do every year in Pakistan. But, you know, again, how did this person find me? I have no idea. And they just said, oh, look, we saw your picture. We want to use this. We want to use that. What's your story? And I'm like, OK, but who are you? Where would you come from? And unfortunately, they never answer that because I'm very curious to know how people find you because you don't know what happens. And social media has taught me a lot because uh, I remember once posting a portrait of somebody and it only had four likes, four, not 40, not 400, just four likes. And even one person who I know said, hmm, not your best effort. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. That's what you think. That picture got me two jobs. Wow. So you never know who sees the picture. And then a picture that maybe has 200 likes, nobody even bought a print from it. So, um, you know, people are chasing the amount of likes, the amount of followers, but it's, it's a reminder. Once again, you never know who's seeing it and uh, they don't need to like it. Like I've had many people said, Oh, I want to buy that print. I said, cool. And then I'll go on social media. Did you like it? No, they don't even follow me. So a friend saw it and who knows what seven degrees of separation there is. So it's very, uh, it, it's interesting. So it's, um, I, f I find it strange, but it's interesting. <laughs> It's interesting you say that actually because Carly, who's a mutual friend of yeah. ours, Carly Lyon, um, she did a post recently about, or I think it might have been from her email newsletter, that she said, um, you know, you, we're all chasing the likes and worried about how many people like mm -hmm. our work on social media and all that sort of thing. Um, and if we all focus entirely on that, um, there will be opportunities missed and the, and there may be things that you think, oh, my goodness, I only got the four likes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden it explodes and you've got an, an amazing – couple of amazing contracts out of it. So yeah. so I think I think we that was great advice from Carly. We all need to stop focusing on that and and really sort of recognising that what we're doing is is actually good. Yeah, we have, you have to take everything with a pinch of salt. Like I, I take a lot of portraits and now I'm doing a new series which are very colorful and there's a lot of graffiti in it. And uh, it's not getting many, it's not getting much traction. But again, people that I have photographed in the past say, can you do that with my print? And I'm like, sure, but your picture's two years old. Yeah, yeah, but I love that picture. Can you do the same thing? I'm like, okay, great. And again, unexpected. I'm exploring something new. I'm trying something new, which is a personal project. And uh, luckily, yeah, there there is some feedback, but you don't likes are just virtual, as we know. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, you, you have to try it and follow your gut. It might not work, but mm. you never know. If you don't try, you don't know. So just do it. Absolutely, yeah. So talking of doing it, what was your f what's your favorite photograph you've ever taken, or your favorite moment of taking a photograph in terms of being in a moment that you thought, oh my goodness, here I am. I'm, this is what I'm doing for a living. Oh gosh, it's hard to narrow it down. When it comes to sailing every year with the Sydney to Hobart, if I'm in a helicopter, there's always a moment where I put the camera down, even if it's for two or three seconds. And I just, I remember poking my head out, looking to the left, looking to the right. I'm saying, look at this place. And I'm one of those 10 or 15 helicopters that are up in the air in the whole world and it is it's a buzz it's beautiful and you just realize how lucky you are and then i said oh gotta go take the picture Can't put your thinking cap back on but it is um yeah th those are moments where you just look at it and say wow like check this out and uh it is it is mind-blowing it's uh you can't think about it too much because then you get carried away but i'd say for sailing that's one of the highlights and um otherwise you know there are there are other moments i can think of when i was in the middle east Maybe there was a picture, a portrait I took of a girl that was very difficult. Not not difficult. Um, I'll try to sum it up. There was this girl that I saw in a classroom, and I don't know why my eyes just went towards her, saying, oh, my gosh, who is this kid? Beautiful eyes, like very attractive. And then uh, when class finished, they all came around to get their portrait taken, and all the kids, like, they were literally on top of me. They wanted to see the back of the camera, and I had the person in front of me. And in the meantime, while I was looking at the camera just to see the picture I just took, I was saying, where is this girl? I need to take a picture of this girl. Like, there's something. And uh, all of a sudden, this girl's in front of me. I got nervous, and I missed the shot. 
Oh. And I could see while I was shooting that the camera wasn't focusing properly and I was still shooting and I was saying, Andrea, concentrate for crying out loud. Just do not mess this up. It was the end of a long trip. I hadn't been eating well. I was tired. And look, mistakes happen, not a problem. And I looked at the back of the camera and I flicked one picture, two pictures, three pictures, and I could see they were all out of focus. I lifted the camera up, said one more, and the girl had gone. Huh? I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So anyway, I finished taking all these pictures. And then uh, the headmaster, the teacher of the class comes to me, says, sir, okay, you finished. And I look at the picture again. I go back and I find it out of focus, out of focus. I was like, no, 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 I can't. It can't be possible. I said, where is this girl? I said, oh, she went back home. And I'm like, how big is this village? It can't be that big. Like, come on, we have to find her. Like, I cannot leave with an out of focus picture. Anyway, uh, cut a long story short. The girl comes back 20 minutes later and I take her picture. And this time I said, Andrea, just hold your breath. Do not mess this up. Concentrate. Like, really, I was not starstruck. I was nervous. And yeah. this was a five-year-old kid in front of me. Yeah. And um, eventually we took the picture. And then I went back to where I was having lunch. And this girl follows me. And then um, we're having a chat. And the girl's standing there in the corner. And I'm wondering, what is she doing? Like, she saw it. I took her picture. It's finished. And then... Um, a project that we're going to talk about later, but I was asking my guide saying, listen, you know, you said we were going to start sponsoring a kid in this school. Who is it? And he looked at me a little bit baffled and saying, it's that girl over there. That's why she's here. <gasps> and I'm like, no, I called her back because I wanted to take her picture because I messed it up before. And he looked at me again and said, I don't know what you're going on about, but this is the girl that we're sponsoring. Wow. So just the whole circle that it did, I found that really strange. And that's a picture that has, I'm not kidding you, won maybe eight or nine awards around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so those are the two moments that I remember very, then there are others, obviously, but those are two moments that I was like, wow. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, so it's pretty cool. So the connection was kind of already there the on a spiritual was there, level of I, some sort. I didn't know it. Like, I remember... It was in a school and I'd seen the school the year before and the teacher opened the door and I knew exactly what was going to be behind that door and all that kind of, and all the kids stood up, said, oh, good morning, sir. But this little kid was at the back of the classroom and she did not stand up and she just stuck her head out just to see what's all the fuss about. And I remember the moment she stuck her head out with the corner of my eye, I saw her and I turned and I'm like, oh my God, who is that? And yeah, then the story that I just told you. So it, there was something very strange in that, um, in that moment. So, um, so yeah, those are the two moments that I'd say are, are highlights for me. So obviously that's um, a connection you've made with her. Do you think that photograph is so good because of that connection to a certain extent? Um, at the beginning, I didn't think the picture was that great. I mean, it was a nice shot, yeah. but I didn't think it was that great. And then I showed it to a friend of mine who's a photographer that I respect professionally and he looked at it and said mate that is a great shot and i'm like really because i know how hard it was like i know the environment i know the smells and i know all that kind of stuff so it's my story but you haven't you weren't there so yeah. you're just looking at a picture for what it is and uh, he said no no it's great like look at the intensity in the eyes like this girl is not five years old she looks a lot older there was something in it and i'm like okay and i left it to that Mm. And then there was a photo competition that came up. I edited the picture in two or three different ways and then uh, found the way that I liked it. And I sent it off, got one award, then got another one. I'm like, oh, OK, there's something to it. Yeah. And um, so obviously it's a nice picture. A lot of people compare it to the famous Afghan girl on the National Geographic. And I'm like, yeah, I wish it was that picture. Yeah. But it is, there is an intensity in it. And I have it hanging in my living room and um, I still look at it. And that picture was taken in 2013. And then every time I look at it, I just stop and I'm like, damn, like, wow, yeah. there's, it's intense. And that girl, I've been photographing her for the following four years, exactly in the same way, just to see how she's grown. Yeah. And she's a girl that I'm sponsoring with my charity. Wow. So, it's, um, so yeah, there's a big story behind it, but obviously yeah. it can stand by itself because other people have, uh, have noticed it. So, so, so a couple of things I want to unpack in that moment yeah. that we've just spoken about. So. One is um, you showed that photograph to another photographer that you respect and I think this is something we need to share on the podcast is that it doesn't matter how successful or how in good we are at what we do, we all at some point experience a kind of imposter so syndrome moment of, oh, I'm not sure if that's actually very good. And then somebody else is taught, says, no, actually, that's very good. Um, and I and I think that's something that we have to say to the 
to, especially to the women listening to this podcast, um, that work through that and and find those people, find those mentors that you can say, what do you think of this? And they support and, and they will give you an honest answer of whether they think it's good or bad. Um, so that's the one thing I wanted to mention that just to point out, to, it happens to literally everybody, Absolutely. no matter how good you are at what you do. Um, and then the second one was um, you mentioned your um, charity. So can we unpack that a little bit and you tell me a little bit about that? So far from the water and the boats that I photograph, I started a charity in 2011 called My First School, and it's uh, based in northern Pakistan. And the aim initially was to help girls get an education in primary school. And so I went there. I've been going there since 2008. So I'd seen schools. I'd sussed out a couple of things and just see how things work. And um, yeah, so it's an Australian registered charity. And um, I go there every year besides COVID, obviously. But I go there every year with the funds raised. And it is to improve schooling conditions in a particular valley in the northern part of the country. So we build benches. You fix windows, fix the roof. And then we started this uh, sponsorship program of which this girl that I just told you the story about is a kid that we're still sponsoring today after she's in seventh grade. She started in first grade, so six years, seven years. Um, and now she's yeah, in seventh grade. So we are doing as much as we can to improve the schooling conditions. We're paying teachers a salary, which is still low to their standards, but you know it's better than nothing. But we're also sending the teachers to do a two-month course. At the beginning, it was two months um, to improve their skills. So just trying to raise. So we have eight schools that we're helping left, right, and center with whatever they need. And you know, there was one school uh, in particular when I saw it the first time. There were three classrooms and four tents. Wow. So in summertime, we're at 2,000 something meters in the mountains. In summertime, it's quite hot. And in wintertime, obviously, it's freezing, freezing. and it's snow. Yeah. And uh, so the first year, we got rid of the tents and we rented a, a house that was already built across the road. And then the second year, we built classrooms. Then we put a roof on it. And little by little, we built up to it. And in 2018, when I went back, the I'll always remember this, the principal who I've known since we started following the school, the moment I arrived, he grabbed me by the arm, said, sir, sir, come have a look. We enter a classroom that was one of the classrooms that we built. And um, there's this, what do you call it, dashboard with all the switches, one cable going to the roof, and there was one light bulb. Oh, my goodness. One. And obviously, he flicked it on and said, we have light. And I was like, Farhad, like how many times do you flick on the light or do you leave it on and give it for granted? And this light bulb did not make any light, obviously, because it's not powerful enough. But some years ago we only had tents and now we have this and now we're hoping to get a generator to make more electricity and all that kind of stuff so it's these little things that make uh that are going to make a big difference yeah so it's, it's pretty uh, I, I don't know i find it very rewarding yeah not wrong so when you say we who's we me myself and i <laughs> wow <laughs> so no we have a there's a board of directors obviously because it's a australian charity and it's a requirement yeah but when i say we basically myself and my guide uh, Said, who lives in the area and he's from there so he knows everybody and uh, gets everything organized uh, two or three months before I go there I tell him look we have X amount of money yeah. he does the groundwork goes to the school saying what do you need everybody gives their wish list and then obviously depending on the funds that we have we try to do as much as we can to try and help everybody as evenly as possible that's brilliant that's pretty cool and how do you raise funds for it I have a dinner once a year mm -hmm. and uh, make donations, silent auctions. Uh, I've been selling some prints and then uh, just donations. You know, it's my networks telling everybody, sending an email saying, look, I'm going back. You know, even during COVID, obviously I didn't go back, but we kept the donations. So I still received donations, but I was sending a minimum mm -hmm. to keep the minimum going ahead. So to keep the kid into school, the two child children that we're supporting and to uh, keep the salary of the teachers going. Then hopefully um, in 2023, when I go back, we'll go full steam ahead and keep on keep on making some good changes. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to the invite to the dinner. Okay. Yeah. Good. And um, and we'll promote that all, everywhere we can for you. Thank you. Yeah, on the Boat Princess channels. Absolutely. We have multiple channels now. <laughs> So, Andre, you obviously take photographs of uh, boats for promotion purposes for manufacturers and all that sort of thing. 
but you also do a lot of um, sailing events and racing and so on and so forth. And I've heard that you do something rather special at those events. Can you tell us about that? So when I have time, because it depends what event you're working on, I like taking portraits. And we all know that taking pictures of boats is fantastic. I love it. It's a passion. It's a job also. But I also try to focus on the people sailing because without them, the boats don't do anything and they don't go anywhere. That has brought me to taking portraits of sailors and more specifically portraits of women sailing in Australia. And I started with the Sydney to Hobart and I did it just for fun, just to do something different because it was the week before the event. So there's not much going on because everybody's keeping their boat wrapped up and nobody wants to break anything. But I wanted to do something like we have to keep the buzz going. Come on. Yeah. And uh, so I just said, I put the word out, I said, all right, any women doing the Sydney to Hobart, I'll take your portrait for free and I'll happy to give it to you. We're just going to do a women sailing in Australia. And a lot of people turned up, which was great. And then the following year, I wasn't going to do it because I said, well, I've done it last year. I'm not going to repeat myself. But I started getting like a month out. A lot of people saying, oh, are you going to do the portraits again, please? Because I wasn't there last year. And I'm like, OK, let's try and do it. Let's do something different. So uh, so I did that. And again, it was a huge turnout. And now people are expecting it. So I'm like, well, <laughs> I wanted a weekend off. But no, go for it. So then... Um, yeah, last year I did again, uh, let's call them the Hobart Girls, and it was a good turnout. And then I decided I did the Australian Women's Keelboat Challenge, uh, Keelboat Regatta, sorry, in Melbourne. And obviously being only women, when they when the client approached me and they said, look, we want you to cover our event, I said, that's fantastic, but can I also take portraits? And I think the email was a bit like, what do you mean take portraits? We want you as a sailing photographer. And then somebody in the group email said, yeah, yeah, please come and take your portraits. And I did that too. And it was really great. And there you had like 115 people turned up. It was, it was great. And everybody enjoyed it. Everybody heard about it before. So a lot of people, if somebody didn't know it, their friend did say, no, no, come on, you have to go get a, your portrait taken from Andrea. It's really fun and blah, blah, blah. So that built up its momentum. And then I did it now at Magnetic Island uh, during race week. So I have to do it during events where I have time, obviously, because it is uh, it is time consuming because once we get off the water, we have to start editing and uh, and you got to get the pictures out there. But it's something it's building up its momentum. And I'm going to do it again this year. This year, I'm going to do the double handed uh, sailors in the race and then yeah. obviously women um, participating in it. Wow. So it'll be a great portfolio. And I do hope one day to be able to do an exhibition on sailing yeah and then there will be people boats hands because of a series of hands and that's the contact we have with the boat so it's not just boating 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 that's awesome so it's something different yeah it's very different and you do that complimentary don't you yeah yeah no it's it's my it's my passion it's my call it networking also but it's um no i do it I, i enjoy it it's 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 fun and uh and especially i see people are enjoying the same thing they enjoy it they like it they like to something different and a lot of people it's funny when you see maybe to any age someone come in and said oh i'm doing the city to hobart said oh fantastic what boat are you yeah but my friend is doing it too but she doesn't want to have her picture taken like oh okay so it's nice to see that they're pushing each other come on i'll do it if you do it yeah. it's cute it's 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 a nice reaction to see so okay come on and uh and it's good to see that people are coming back yeah and because oh i changed boat of a new you know crew t-shirt so okay cool let's do it so it's uh i don't know i like it i like seeing people's reaction like that that's awesome. and so far nobody's complained about their portrait <laughs> maybe maybe not hearing from them is a sign but nobody said seriously did you have to choose that one so so far so good <laughs> Well, I have a little suggestion for those people having their portraits taken by you this year um, at Sydney to Hobart and at any other event in the future. Uh, let's. Uh, Andrea does it from the goodness of his heart, but he also has his charity from the goodness of his heart. So I'm suggesting that anybody had, has their portrait done by Andrea, complimentary, in the next uh, events over the next year, let's give him whatever we can afford to give him for that portrait, which is he will give to his charity. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, let's do that. And it's tax deductible. Yeah, so let's not name any particular figure. That's just no, no. what you can afford. Um, hand over to Andrea for that amazing charity. He's looking up to those young women and educating them. Thank you. On the other side of the world. So cool. that be oh, That's cool. Thanks. Yeah. So um, you obviously are an amazing photographer now, incredibly talented. You do some amazing work. Um 
how have you got to that level? How have you, um, I mean, did you have some original training or have you, are you completely self-taught? What's, what's your training? So I am self-taught. Uh, I started working as a graphic designer which I think uh, has its importance because it's all about composition, proportions, and all that kind of stuff, which uh, hopefully reflects in the work later on. And then I worked in a photo agency in Milan specialized in boats. And I did that for two years. And then uh, life brought me here. I came here looking for work. And yeah, 22 years later, I'm still doing it. So I got something right. But it's just a question of practicing and trying to do things differently because without sounding arrogant, if I get bored looking at the pictures later, there's a good chance the client's going to get bored mm -hmm. and I don't want to take that risk. So you obviously push yourself and try something different. I was one of the first people doing not underwater pictures of boats, but putting the camera in the boat here in Australia, uh, the, sorry, the camera in the water uh, here in Australia. And, and I remember clearly in Hamilton Island, I did it once and everybody was like, oh my God, somebody fell in the water at the buoy. And it's like, no, it was me hanging onto the buoy because there was a lot of current, but I just took some pictures and you know started that. Then I stopped, then I tried to improve it, then the cameras improved. So it's a lot, it's a lot of trial and error. And as we said before, if you don't try and make mistakes, you're not gonna learn. But it is, um, so it's just trying and then also seeing what other people are doing and not necessarily in sailing. Um, I've, I, I love photo books, for example, photography books. And I think I may have maybe 100, 120 books. Not, it's not a huge collection, but they're aimed. Um, I think one for sure, I don't remember still how the second one, is about sailing. The rest are street photography, a lot of portraits, a bit of fashion, and it's, just something that I, I don't know, uh, I, I can't tell you how looking at a portrait gives you an idea to take a picture of a boat. Uh, yeah. That I, I can't figure it out, but there's some things that have. And um, I, I like, for example, I like when a spinnaker drops on a boat. I love the shapes, especially if you can see a hand grabbing the spinnaker, or if you can see a person under the spinnaker, that's the kind of shape that I really like. And, and I like shooting it when it happens. Then I saw a picture that a famous fashion photographer took of a ballet dancer wrapped up in a fabric jumping and striking a pose in, in midair and i was like wow that's beautiful and then i saw a video on how he did it and then i looked at it again and again and again and i was like and then one day it just hit me and said that's like my spinnaker yeah so then i went and i found online a person who's a ballet dancer rented a studio and i told him listen this is a spinnaker cloth from a sailboat you, this is the trampoline. I need to jump. I need you to strike a pose. And let's see what shapes happen. So you're combining a fashion picture and then something that I like seeing on a sailboat. And it made something, I think, quite interesting. It's uh, like if you don't know what it is, a sailor will see, that's a sailcloth. And I said, yeah, but can you see the legs? Can you see the shape? Can you see the shape of the body? And um, then like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I see it. So I think it's a successful picture. And there's just a series, there's just five pictures that I kept in the end. But it's one of those pictures that you look at it and said, oh yeah, okay, it's, you know, you threw a piece of sail in the air. I said, no, not really. Like you can see a leg behind the sail. Not in transparency, but you can see the shape because there's a big fan also blowing just to make things more complicated. And uh, so it's, it's a layered picture, the more you look at it. So yeah, there's a lot of inspiration or ideas coming looking at what's around you. That's awesome. And you're obviously an artist, so you're quite emotional about your work. Oh, I'm, I'm Italian. I'm Come guessing. on. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> so artist plus Italian. Oh, my God. That's a, that's quite a combination, isn't it? So um, so the that when you do something that you really think is wonderful and you really enjoy doing it and then – have you ever had a reaction from the audience that sees it that says, oh, no, don't? And how do you cope with that? How do you cope with that negative reaction to something you've put so much into? It's months of therapy. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. It's, um, I don't know. Um, when it comes to, say, like, example, there's a picture that's in the Mirabeau uh, yachting, uh, yachting Photography Award that I took last year of a classic yacht that was hit by a big wave. And the boat, it's not airborne, but it's almost all out of the water. And um, we had really rough conditions in Sydney Harbour. It's yeah. a nice shot. Okay, great. I like it. 
and I posted it on Instagram. And again, everybody's like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. What conditions, what was happening in Sydney and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, we had wild conditions. It was beautiful, don't get me wrong. But, yeah. um, but the picture itself, it's nice. Cool, it's a good shot. It's something that's in my portfolio. And um, again, two or three other photographers, mate, that's competition material. And I'm like, really? And I personally did not think that at all. Like I still today don't, yes, it's a nice shot, but I don't think it's competition material. I sent it in anyway. I said, you know what? I'm going to listen to other people and just, um, so the opposite of what we were talking about before with the girl mm. picture in Pakistan, I sent it in and it made the finals. So I was like, mm, okay, great. So again, be open to criticism because maybe there's something that you don't see or for whatever reason. That's a positive instance. Mm. Um, doing something the other way around where I thought it was good and it didn't work. I don't think it happened, but I'm not saying this out of lack of modesty, is that I just didn't like it. Mm. And uh, So you wouldn't put it forward? No, I wouldn't because if it's not like there's... Um, I just discovered recently some artists here in Sydney and they do stuff with... Uh, very colorful, very vibrant. They use gold leaf. And I'm like, ooh, I like gold leaf. I like the idea. So I went to do a course on gold leaf painting mm. and uh, came out of it, had some prints with me, did some tests. Like I was going to conquer the world. I was going to do everything. This was going to go on exhibition. Like my uh, superannuation was going to go up big time. Like I was ready. <laughs> And it belly flopped big time. Oh, no. Big time. Like, I tried it once at home, tried it twice, showed my girlfriend, who's also a creative person, and we just looked at it and said, yeah, it's nice. And I looked at her and said, a bit more enthusiasm? <laughs> and she's like, no, like, yes, but there's something there, but it was done the wrong way. And I had bought everything. I'd bought the gold leaf. I bought the paintbrush. Oh. Like I had everything. I was set up. Major Th this investment. Was, this was my future project. Yeah. I think after three weeks, I just did it, looked at it, left it there, looked at it again, left it there, threw it in the bin. But that gave me an idea for something else. You learned from the failure. So you're building up on it. I said, okay, I like the gold, but I don't like it just because of the way it was looking on a picture. So I started doing it in Photoshop. And then I started layering it. And then I started doing graffiti. And now I have a whole series, which is, is it's called Color is the New Black. But then it's, I've changed it over time because um, it's more targeted towards the people that I'm shooting. But it is a portrait of the person. And then there's tons of graffiti, spray paint, pictures, my picture, stuff that I find on the internet. And I just throw it on there and it looks like it's a background. And um, that's the development of it. So mm -hmm. if I hadn't done the gold part, which was a massive failure financially and, <laughs> and, uh, and morally speaking, I would not have been able to follow up. Yeah. Because I knew, I said, I like the gold, I like it. And then I saw a documentary on Andy Walhar, which is one of my heroes. And I'm like, how do I combine these two things? And it was trial and error, trial and error. And trust me, I threw away a lot of prints. And it just didn't work. Yeah. And I still have gold leaves in my, in my drawer, and they're going to stay there for a long time because it just didn't happen. But luckily, it wasn't shown in the public, so I wasn't shot down in flames. <laughs> but it was um, like, yeah, I was all this is great. This is fantastic. It's something new. Nobody's done it. And maybe that's why nobody's done it. <laughs> because it, just, it just doesn't work. Well, it didn't work. It doesn't work with the kind of photography that I do. Yeah. But it was an important stepping stone because without that one, I've never been it able to, to do the graffiti stuff. Yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And I think that's another lesson that we need to put out there. We, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to have some very successful businesses, but I've had some things on the way through and that really haven't worked. Um, we've tried them, we've done them, and flopped completely. Yep. So, um, and I think that is something really important. Um, you just get back up, you look at it and think, how can I do this differently? And you try it another way. And hey, presto, that is the way that it should be. So yeah, yeah, it, yeah. You ha you have to try. I remember very early days. I was still shooting film. A client asked me a picture of their boat with the spinnaker, and there was a logo on the spinnaker. And for me, it was the most boring picture in the world to take, but that's what they wanted. I said, okay, that's what you're going to get. Not a problem. Yeah. While I was out on the water, I noticed that on the bow of the boat, there was the same logo on the boat, but it was very small, subtle, but you could still see it. 
and I saw it, so I took the picture that he wanted, and uh, so you know, respect the brief, otherwise you get in trouble. Yeah. And then I told my boat driver, "Hey, try to do this." And we did something a little bit crazy, but you know, it was a boat test, so they knew what we were doing. And I really got in low, wide angle, and you have the bow of the boat coming about to hit me, and you can see the little logo on the bow, and it's right there because it was a white hull, and the logo was blue, so you couldn't miss it. And uh, I remember getting all the film process, looked at the results. And I said, oh, that's cool. I like it. So I gave the client the sheet of slides and said, here are your pictures. That's the one you wanted. And it's like, fantastic. That's exactly what I want. Great shot. Thank you. Well done. And here's something else that I tried. And he just went, oh, my God, that's the shot. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And he did not use the picture that he wanted. So, again, you have to try. And now with digital, you know, if you don't like it, it's just delete or format the card. Yeah. But um, you, you, ha you have to try. It doesn't mean, um, and as we said before, if you don't fail, it's, you're not, you're not going to learn. But also, you're not going to try and do better. Yes. Because you're, you're just like, I, I tell my daughter when she's drawing, oh, dad, I did this drawing of a duck. Look at it. So that's really cool. I like the idea. Try it again. But dad, <laughs> and I was like, no, try it again. And then if I can get through to her. She has done it a couple of times, and then as you do it, the more and more you improve on it, or you add something to it, or you put some more colors, or whatever. So, and then I told her, said, so the first one's cool, we like it, but look at the last one. I said, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, I like that, it's cool. So you're building on it, and you have to try. So you yeah. got, you have to push yourself. But yeah, as you said, it's more the amount of failures than the amount of success. Yeah, especially in, I guess, in an artistic world that you're in. You know, you've got to try so many different things to, to get what you actually want. Yeah. You, you have to, otherwise, otherwise you're. It's boring. Yeah. And and I don't want to get bored. <laughs> it's not a. <laughs> and look, I'm really lucky because with sailing, the boats are different. The weather conditions are different. Water is always going to react in a different way. Uh, the location's different. So there are a lot of elements that can change. But you also have to, you know, if it's windy, everybody can take a nice picture. It's when there's no wind and it's raining that you have to really say, how am I going to get something out of this? Yes. And, and you have to you have to try. And as I said, with digital now, you just try it and you have no idea how many pictures I go delete, delete, delete. Oh, nice. Delete, delete. Oh, another nice one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a learning curve. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you're out on the water as part of your job and sometimes you're up in a helicopter. Yes. Um, that up in the helicopter moment. Was that the first time you did that? Was that a little bit, little bit scary? Um, the first time I did it, I was in Italy, and I remember there was an old America's Cup boat that was called French Kiss, oh. and it was obviously a classic yacht. And at that stage, I really, I don't, know, I wasn't even shooting full time, but I had this opportunity, and the helicopter was paid by the event. It was a big helicopter, so there are three photographers, and we got the right angle, and there was a photographer who knew what he was doing, so he put us in the right spot, so everybody, we got the shot. And the picture was nice, nothing amazing. But I remember looking through the lens and saying, wow, this was the America's Cup. Yeah. Like this boat was the America's Cup. And here am I photographing it, knowing very well that it was just a local race. It was nothing like, didn't even make it on the news. But I got a taste of it. Yeah. And I said, I like this aerial stuff. And um, yeah, obviously, whenever there's the opportunity, I like doing it because it is. Uh, so I don't. I mean, I don't suffer heights, obviously, luckily. Yeah. But it is, uh, it's it's adrenaline. It's great. And then there's the pressure of time because obviously you're paying every minute that you're up in the air, so you got to make the most of it. So you have to work fast. And uh, sometimes you do have to waste time and wait for the right moment. But sometimes you really need to to step on it. So it's um it, it's a great way of seeing boats. It's something different and allows you to do a, a good variety of stuff too. So talking of time, you obviously are under a huge amount of pressure when you're doing an event like that to get the photos pro so, touched up. What if, what, if you, what would you do? What do you do with those photos once you've taken them? So once you come back from the race, you go home, you edit them. So you decide how many pictures you want to keep. Not, not as in a number, but you just look at the nice pictures. You know, there might be a sequence of a boat plowing through a wave out of three shots, five shots. Two are really good. The rest, they're nice, but they're not as good as the two that you shot. So you delete those. And then uh, once you've narrowed it down, you have to caption everything. So uh, if you ask me, I want a picture of Comanche, and I have 2,000 pictures in my archive of that boat or that race, I can find them very quickly. And then you just have to do the editing. And the editing for me is very simple. Like it's, uh, I'm, I'm still a bit old school. I have, to embrace, I have to embrace Photoshop a little bit more. But 
if you couldn't do it in the dark room in the old days, you don't do it in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not going to start changing the color of the sky or making the sunset. Yeah, maybe the sunset a little bit warmer you can, but you don't add stuff or take things away. So the edit has to be quite simple. So you're uh, a hashtag no filter guy. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I love that. No, no, <laughs> keeping keeping it real. <laughs> Absolutely. But then again, it depends what the clients want. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of people, again, if it's for an advertisement, I'll do my editing. And then I know that the advertisement agency is going to edit the living daylight out of it because yeah. that's what they do. If it's somebody's portrait, I've had portraits where people, I prefer simple, I prefer no makeup, especially with, with women, just because I want the real expression, I want the look that counts. That's scary um, for women, you know that, right? It is, yeah, no, I know it's scary <laughs> and it makes a lot of people uncomfortable and I did it and a lot of people, a couple of TV presenters did it mm. and they were like, I wanna do it. Yeah. I said, okay, cool, let's catch up. And then the moment they we were face to face, they're like, Mm, not sure about this. And I'm like, look, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. No, no, let's do it. Yeah. And then the pictures came out nicely, luckily. But it's about the expression. Like, you know, when they let down their guard or when they have a moment to themselves or whatever it is. So it's catching that moment. It's not about the looks. Yeah. But again, as I was saying, editing wise, there are some pictures, portraits that are edited to the moon and back because that's the style that they need. Yeah. But in that case, I give it out to an editor to do because I'm not that good at it. And it's time consuming. Yes. So. Yeah. Ah, that's um that's a really interesting concept for women to have their photograph taken without makeup. I know lots of women are very comfortable without makeup and that's their thing and that's awesome. But somebody like myself, um, your, your makeup does give you a bit of a, a confidence boost and a mask to wear to the world and say, you know, this is a better version of me, I think, right? Um, but it's interesting that uh, <coughs> to actually do that, yeah, to completely, because it would be a different. You're naked. Yeah. You would feel totally different having your photo yeah. taken without your makeup on. And the difficulty I find is that some people are really aware of it and some people eventually forget about it. Yeah. And when I take portraits, especially if we have a sitting for an hour, it's not rare that I talk to a person for half an hour before I even take, like the lights are set up, the camera's in my lap, but we're just, oh, how's your day? And just have a chat. And little by little, you see that they're letting their guard down. But in the meantime, I'm looking at you. So I know you look better that way. I like the way you smile. You have a cheeky grin when you put your hand up, this and that. So I'm observing you in the meantime, which maybe I shouldn't tell my secret because now everybody's (laughs) going to be aware of it. But it is, uh, and then you catch the moment. And, um, And it has happened to me there's one lady that I remember who had a really terrible story about her life and I shot her. And then six months later, I contacted her again and saying, I like the picture we took. I want to do something different. Can you come back? And she was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. And so I sat. we sat down, the lights were set up. She was sitting on the stool and I was sitting in front of her and I remembered a lot about her story. So I remember what she was trying to study to do and all that kind of stuff. And I uh, was saying, oh, you know, did you end up doing that diploma? And she was like, oh, you remember? I said, yeah, like we had a chat, remember? Yeah. <laughs> but I remembered these things. And as I was looking at her, I was just, as she was talking, I was looking at her, looking at her, looking at her. And she had a very violent past, unfortunately. And then at one point, she just turned her head to think. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the shot. Yeah. And I just told her, like, okay, stop one minute, do that again. I moved the lights around, we got the shot. And I remember that shoot, we took six pictures in one hour, not 60, just six, because yeah. they were really aimed. Two of them are nice, of which one of them is a picture that I still today. It's very dramatic, very dark, but it works. So it's uh, it's a lot of I, I like observing people. It's I find it fascinating, and then hearing their stories is absolutely. But again, there was no makeup, and it went really well with this story. I guess that's another really nice side of your your work, isn't it? You get to meet some amazing yeah. people you and hear, hear some their stories. Great stories. Yeah, some amazing. Like you walk out. Some stories you walk out of the shoot, you're like, I'm not complaining anymore. Yeah. Like there's no, just just, next time you complain, I'll kick myself in the butt. Like just shut up and move on. And other times there's some really uplifting ones that like, cool. It gives you more faith in humanity. Yeah. And talking about portraits, because I'm a photographer, my mother always says, oh, you know, there's never a picture of you. Said, yes, mom, that's why I'm behind the camera because (laughs) I I don't like it. Um, But one day I had a shoot and the client was late. And I was just like, really? And I'm on time. Like, I'm worse than Japanese people. I'm there five minutes before and I'm ready to go. And this guy 
on the spot called saying, oh, I'll be there in half an hour. I said, you're supposed to be here now. Yeah. Like you knew that half an hour ago that you're going to be late. Anyway, don't don't get me started on that. So I was there set up and I was just like, well, I'm not going to start doing something because this guy's going to write. So I took a selfie. Yeah. A professional selfie, may I add, not yeah. just one with the. So I put the camera on the tripod and I just started having fun. Just to say, I want to see how people feel. And it was just myself. There was no one else in the room. I was so uncomfortable. Wow. Because I knew I was taking a picture of myself. Then I got into it and I remembered a couple of poses that I liked of other photographers and a couple of nice pictures came out. And I posted it. And uh, I rarely post pictures of myself. I posted the image and I just said, yeah, this is what happened. Somebody arrived late. So I took a professional selfie. And the comments, oh, my God, that is so cool. Beautiful picture. I'm like, okay, thank you. Very kind of you. And then happened again. Client arrived late. All right. Professional selfie. You know what it means. Client's late. Again. But they're all really close. Like above the eyebrows, you can see my chin like really close up because I want the eyes to do the talking. There you go. So, ah. it's uh, did I start something new? I don't know, but it's fun. Well, it's but just, it, it is it's uncomfortable. just Rembrandt me reborn, really, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I take mean, that. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> you did plenty of self portraits, and um, and the light in those are just oh, no. mind blowing. Light, light's important. Mind Without blowing. that, you don't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, what if you? If you imagine somebody listening to this podcast wants to get into photographing in the boating industry, how would you start if you were them? Uh, I think I'd start like I started, just go to the, your local yacht club and get on a boat and practice because obviously you, even though you might know how to photograph, you don't know how to photograph boats and um, just get into it and just try and try and try. And, uh, you know, then little by little, I remember I started with dinghies, 470s on Lake Como with a cousin of mine who was sailing. Oh, and you I, started on Lake Como. Oh, yes. you poor thing. Yeah, I, I know. mean, well, was, was that okay for you? It I was mean... fine because George Clooney hadn't bought his house yet. So at least <laughs> there weren't too many paparazzis around and I could work in peace and quiet. Yes, it was fine. <laughs> so yes, Lake Como and Lake Garda were the two places where I, where I started shooting boats. And the first regatta, I'll always remember this. And that's how I literally fell into it. There was a, my cousin's 470 tied to the dock. I put my foot on the boat, slipped, and fell between the dock and the, <laughs> and the boat. And luckily, I didn't hurt myself, but obviously, I was drenched. And my cousin just looked over, shook his head, and he said, you're staying on the dock. <laughs> I'm like, you bastard. <laughs> so I stayed on the dock, and he went sailing with somebody else. And I was soaking wet. Thank goodness it was summertime. But his, cam- his bag was on the dock with me, and he had a camera in it. Yeah. So I took the camera out and started shooting. No idea what I was doing. It was on. I remember very well. I turned it on and I didn't even look if it was on manual, automatic, nothing. Like I just turned on the camera and started shooting. Thank God it was on automatic. Yeah. And um, just took pictures from the dock of boats passing in front of me. And a mother at the end of the regatta came up to me saying, oh, you were taking pictures. I'm like, yeah, hello. Like you saw a camera in my hand. I said, do you have pictures of my son? And I immediately did one plus one. I'm like, uh, let me go process the film and I'll see what I have. So oh, I remember to the, those folks when we used to go to the chemist. Chemist, and you waited and, and one hour. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, for some of you out there, you don't even know what that means. Yeah, that was a plastic thing that had an emulsion on it where the image was it was taken. <laughs> so I went and I got these postcard prints back and I just showed them to the to the mom and she found two pictures that I, unfortunately, I don't have the negatives anymore, but they were terrible. But, you know, it was a picture of her kid, so it was great. Yeah. She said, oh, how much do you want for these prints? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, processing was 10 bucks. The film was $8. Like, let's do $20. So said, yeah, yeah, cool. And that's how I started. Wow. So that's how I think a lot of people should start, especially now with digital. Everybody can take a picture, which yeah. is a good thing and a bad thing. But go to your local club. Start to get to know everybody. You start from the shooting from the start boat, get on a dinghy if you can so you can move around and um, and just start little by little. Awesome. Then you build your way up. Yeah. And it's everybody's dream. You know, one day you can come do the start of the Sydney to Hobart, which is a buzz in itself. Yeah. Is that your so, favorite, the Sydney to Hobart? Uh, look, yes, it is. It's, it's a beautiful race. And I remember the first year. So I came here and I landed on December 12th. And I immediately went to Australian Sailing, the magazine, because it was the only business card contact that I had in Australia when I came here. And um, I went to the editor saying, hi, this is who I am. This is my portfolio. 
you know, do you need any pictures thinking of the Hobart? Mm. And he's like, yeah, no, look, you know, we're okay. But uh, yeah, I might as well do something. And I'm like, come on, you want to spit it out or do I have to wait for you to say it? And like, what about the Hobart? Oh, no, we have another photographer covering for the Hobart. I'm like, oh, but I can get you an accreditation if you want. Then, you know, but I'm, I can't use your pictures. I said, okay, cool. So I did the Pitwaters to Cost race, which was on January 2nd at the time. And um, it was a beautiful day. It was sunny. Everything was new for me. Like I was happiest kid in the world and i remember we were next to watson bay and the gun went off and the moment the gun went off all the people on south head and there were tons of them just burst out into this huge roar and i remember i had them to my back because i was looking at the boats and i heard this roar come like a stadium it was worse than a soccer match in italy and i was like what the heck was that and i turned around and i saw the people there the amount of people i'm like oh my gosh this is like this is mayhem, but yeah. it was amazing to see so many people there. And that's where I understood the culture and the uh, importance of the Hobart. Yeah. It was it was amazing. So yes, it is a great race. And then obviously I'm lucky to go to Tasmania and see the finish and cover a lot kind of stuff and the landscape's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so it, it's good. It's a, it's, a, it's a great race. Everyone's looking forward to it. If you think about it, and I'm gonna get shot for saying this, it's just a race of two or three days, just just it's but a fairly dangerous exactly one. <laughs> it's extremely dangerous i'm i'm not sure but i would say it's probably the hardest amateur race there is in the world yeah. so you know and we know what happened in 98 and all that mm. so um but it is for me as a photographer there's a big build up to it and then the race day is just three or four days of racing um but it's intense it's full on because the boats arrive at the middle of the night like you're on standby for four or five days and i come back and i sleep for a couple of days after that so it is uh but it is a great event like there's a vibe around it that is really special mm. and uh i don't think i've ever seen that anywhere else mm. it is a very very special race yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah rightly so but it's it's great yeah and full of some so many beautiful boats and oh. and a complete range of boats too you know i mean my it's, good friend andrew was in it last year um in in their i think it's 45 yacht yeah it's it's very simple you know well not very simple but you know a normal sort of yacht those are Whereas the, the the out the fronts are just incredibly engineered incredibly expensive to build all the rest of it. it it's amazing like you have the super maxis which are impressive because they are and then you have what i call the real heroes are the guys at the back of the fleet because mm. like any regatta yes the big boats are great they're beautiful to see they go fast but without the cruising division let's give them a name mm. um you don't make the numbers mm. and these guys do it for a passion yeah yeah maybe they have a chance to win but they just do it for a passion because they love sailing and that's where you see the camaraderie come out and when you're down in hobart and everybody arrives no matter what time you arrive if you're first if you're last everybody is greeted exactly the same way and i find that absolutely mind-blowing and yeah. that's that's where you see the spirit of sailing yeah yeah that is an amazing thing about sailing yeah but it's cool mm. so andrea it's been amazing talking to you today thank you same thank you very much for coming in and talking to us um i think what's important about this podcast is to illustrate just how many different ways people can get into the boating industry and yours is a very unique one you know to to be out there photographing and and enjoying that being out on the water lifestyle whilst doing your job. Well, someone's got to do it. Well, someone's got to do it, especially on Lake Como. Oh, right? yes. <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've upgraded to Sydney Harbour now, so it's all right. <laughs> Bit choppier. Or, oh, or thank, is it? Thank good. The lakes can be really rough because yeah. there's no way for the waves to go. Uh -huh. It's like when you're between North Head uh, and South Head here, it's a washing it's machine. It's a washing machine, yeah. And in a lake, because there's no, out, uh, what do you call it, outlet yeah. for the waves to... Uh, the energy to disperse, yeah, I guess. They just come bouncing back. So it yeah. can a lake can be very violent. The ocean can too, but a lake in proportion, I would say maybe is even more violent, uh, also because they're smaller boats. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, Lake Como is a nice place. Yeah, I know. I bad. love Lake Como. I, be, I remember being, staying at, um, when my little boy was very young, we went to, um, we were lucky enough to go to Italy and we stayed in Hotel, Hotel Tromezzo overlooking Lake Como. And I think I was the only person that hung washing on the line in that beautiful hotel <laughs> outside on the balcony. And that's where the tourist is. <laughs> Because because I had an 18-month-old with me and I had to wash his stuff. Yeah, as you do. 
And then the concierge came, my signora, what are you doing? You cannot put the laundry out here. Come we put on. you in a suite. Uh, you do not do this. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but no, Spot the tourist. Part. I know, beautiful part of the world, beautiful. But um, us mums have to do what we have to do Absolutely. when we're traveling with kids. <laughs> so um, let's finish up with uh, talking a little bit of Italian just to make it everybody feel good about their day ahead. <laughs> um, if we can say, um, I love what I do and it's great to be in the boating industry. Adoro quello che faccio e lavorare con le barche è una passione. See, it so, sounds so much nicer when you say it like that. <laughs> and our listeners can't see me, unfortunately, but I did not speak with my hands. <laughs> no, he didn't. I He's wasn't been very gesticulating. Good. Yep. He's been very good because I, I said to him at the start of the podcast, don't tap all over the table because I can hear every tap. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was very good with that. <laughs> Andrea, it's been delight having you here. I would like to th say thank you to Sarah, who is the um, editor at Nautilus magazine, because she introduced us to each other. Yep, she did. And that is a beautiful thing about the uh, boating industry. We do all introduce people to people um, because it is actually a small, especially in Sydney, it's a, it's a small Super world. Small. Small, small world. So we all know each other. Um, so a big thank you to Sarah for introducing us. And yep. um how do we find you, Andrea? So on Facebook, I'm Andrea Francolini, my name. And then Instagram and Twitter, it's at A Francolini. So F R A N C O L I N I with an A in front of all that. And you can see all my pictures there and feel free to message me. Awesome. Yeah, I love I love watching your Instagram posts come up there. Amazing. And I have posted some of Andrea's work on my um, Instagram in the past and shall do in the future as well because I just love his work. So Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Take care. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Boat Princess podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you'd like to know more about what I do and where I am, then you can follow me on Instagram at The Boat Princess. You can also sign up to my newsletter on my website, which is theboatprincess.com. Take care of yourselves, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you on the water soon.